Hi, I'm Lauren Miller. This time on Journeys, I'll introduce you to Moira Brown. She and her team of marine biologists spend hours in the Bay of Fundy in pursuit of the endangered right whale. Now, I know we've heard the word endangered so many times these days, we've almost become desensitized to it. You sort of get a sense of futility, like you can't do anything about it, so why bother getting frustrated even thinking about it? Well, Moira Brown and her team have decided to do something about it. There's only about 300 right whales left in these waters, and they used to number in the hundreds of thousands. It's the most endangered large whale in the world. Moira Brown and her team hope that the research that they are doing will bring the right whale back from the edge of extinction. In detail, the forecast for Fundy and Graham and Ann. Winds will increase from the south ahead of the system, reaching gale force over northern areas this afternoon. I have a funny feeling it's going to be a very short day. Well, at 5 a.m., that's how the day began, with a healthy dose of skepticism. It could be too windy to search for right whales today, but I had to be optimistically skeptical because this is our only day to film right whales. Man, it might be too windy. Mm. So take a look at the channel? Yeah, can't hurt. All right. I mean, I actually sort of leave it up to you, Mo. <laughs> the problem we have here is that the research team has a 30-foot boat to hunt for right whales in the very rough, unpredictable waters of the Bay of Fundy. As I was to find out, this little boat can really get bounced around. The only reason they're even trying to go out today is for our documentary crew. Kind of windy. That's what you look at the seltzer. Okay. Anyway, we'll give it a try. We'll take a peek. Come back for lunch. We're very anxious to see the right whale, the rarest and most endangered whale on Earth. On the leeward side. Every summer they breed right off our doorstep in Canadian waters. We also want to see why Moira Brown and the right whale research team endures very difficult conditions to learn more about this whale. They're working on a project funded by the New England Aquarium in Boston, and they spend most of the summer here identifying the few remaining right whales. Marine weather is a constant concern with such a small boat. It takes two hours traveling before they even get to a place where they'll see whales. Then they spend 10 hours collecting data before they turn around for a two to three hour trip home. Yeah, we're still on the Lubeck Channel here. What we've done, we just come down underneath the Lubeck Bridge, which goes, the International Bridge, which goes between Lubeck and Campobello, which is in Canada, New Brunswick. Oh, yeah. We'll just work our way down uh, through the Lubeck Channel, and then we'll start to see Grand Manan, the island of Grand Manan, okay. which we'll pass to the north of, uh, across the Grand Manan Channel, and then from there we've got about another 10 miles out to the Grand Manan Basin where we can start looking for right whales. Okay. Moira Brown first started work on the right whale identification project after graduating from a program in wildlife biology at McGill University in Montreal. She needed a summer job and counting whales sounded intriguing. Well, that's where it started. And since that summer nine years ago, Moira's work has evolved from counting whales to photographing them to pulling skin and blubber samples. Yeah, that's still the bun. You can see the numbers on the right hand side. Yeah. I think I got involved in this work just out of, a, out of an interest to see how the whale research was done, perhaps even out of a skepticism to see if we really could tell individual whales apart. And I believe we can, and I stay in it just because it it's just completely captivates me. It's completely fascinating. And it, there's so many different facets of it. It's not just pure science, and it's not just conservation or management, but it's putting all these things together in a way so that we can do something to keep right whales around. Simply identifying each right whale provides critical information when you're looking at the genetic health of the whole population. Today, I'd be happy just to find one. Well, it looks like they've got some. 
What you got, Philip? Maybe some breach or some sort. I don't see any blow associated with it, though. So. The whales are identified by distinguishing features like scars and marks and bumps on their heads called the callosity pattern. Once you know who's who, you know who's mating with whom and whether their calves are healthy and surviving. From that, a family history evolves and you can start to understand how healthy the population is. We only have 60 known mothers in this population. So right now, the future of this population is resting on 60 females. And they're only having a single calf every three to four years. So in any given year, we could only expect, let's say between 15 and 20 females to be giving birth. And in fact, we don't even see that many. Ooh, the tide has changed now and it's running against the wind, right? It's around 9.30 in the morning. We've been riding these waves for almost four hours now. Right. It's difficult to even spot the whales in waves hard. like these, and it's definitely too rough to get a steady picture. Yeah, we'd never be out here to do the work in these kind of seas because we're trying to get good quality still photographs yeah. of the whales' velocity patterns, and you'll see if Want to go to it? All right. Okay, okay. Bill, Bill's just reported in a, a sighting of a right whale from about one mile away, so we're going to go directly to it. Okay. And see what we can get. But as I was saying earlier, you'll see that it's very, the, the water almost obscures the velocity pattern in these kinds of seas. Right. There you go. Right on. Yeah, it's about 150. You start to know these animals so well. When we're out on the water, we can identify probably 50 or 60 percent of the animals we see on site. We have a lot of them named, mostly to help us identify them in the field, and they're named for their callosity pattern or, their, or scar. And when you start to see animals having, like the females, for example, you know, we have one, she had a calf in 1967 that we know of, and she's had calves in 81, 84, 87, 91. You start to become quite involved with, with these animals' lives. And you know, we just can't, I mean, it sounds sort of silly, but we just can't wait to get here in, in August to find out who's had a calf. <laughs> you know, if you haven't had a calf for three years, well, then you're, you know, you're due, let's say, in 1993. And so yeah. we're out there racing in the bay, sort of betting with each other who's going to show up with a calf, who isn't. Okay, Jenny, you want to do a watch off the stern, please? One banana in A. We pursued the whale that Phil and Amy spotted for about 20 minutes. It seemed to be evading us, and now with the tide coming in straight at us against high winds, we had to make some decisions. Well, this is the first time we actually saw part of the animal. So far, it's just been a blow, and um, saw a little bit ahead and didn't see any velocity pattern. So my guess is it is probably just a fin whale. It's um, not arching, so we're not seeing a dorsal fin, but. Um, even if it's a right whale, I don't think we'll be able to work it. I mean, it's yeah. blowing once or twice, traveling for seven minutes, and come, you know. Coming back, yeah. oh yeah. I mean, we would never we're be able to get near to get photographs. So. With that news, my optimism is quickly evaporating. Unless a miracle happens, it doesn't look like we'll see right whales or the team's work. And after hearing so much about it all, that's a real disappointment. Uh, definitely, the, the, further, the further we go, just that little turning into the seas, I don't... Yeah. Really We're gonna know get how, how long back. we want to stay yeah. out. No. no, or if we could even shoot anything. I, I mean, we want to shoot you guys working. You're not going to be able right. to work. We can't right. work. Yeah. This. I so, think this is. I, think I don't really want to go chance any and, I don't, and it's only going to get worse through the morning as the tide continues to right. run against the wind. So we call it a dress rehearsal. So I think it, it has probably become a dress rehearsal. Yeah. Just as we agreed to go back for breakfast, Chris took a radio message that right whales had been sighted by a whale watching boat about 20 miles east of our location. So despite the waves, the team was ready to give it a try. In fact, as we traveled with the tide and the wind, the seas seemed a lot calmer. We hoped we'd get lucky. Okay, this is what we've been waiting for. At that first sighting, everyone on the team knows exactly what to do. Hopefully, it's not another false alarm. Once we encounter right whales, then the first priority is photo identification. 
we take mug shots basically of the callosity pattern on their head. These callosities are black, raised, roughened areas on the rostrum. And the rostrum is the top part of the head between the blowholes and, and the tip of the, the tip of the snout or the bonnet. Right. Okay. And each right whale has a different pattern on their head. So what we want to try and do is get left side, right side, mm -hmm. head on if possible. Mm -hmm. And then some of these whales, well many of these whales, over 50% of these whales have scars on them from various encounters with Ready, boats and fishing gear and this kind of thing. Mm. So we use those as identifying characteristics as well. The team has compiled their photographs into a right whale catalog. It also includes diagrams and remarks about the distinguishing features of each like individual whale. Truck bias to me. Well, except the one that truck, truck bias had uh, fluke scars in 1660. When we scars. realized we could distinguish between individuals, then that allows us to monitor the population, monitor reproduction, survivorship, mortality. All these things that when you're just when you're just out there counting whales, you don't know how old they are, other than gross size differences between calves and adults. Look, if you have any requests, just holler. Think you need to speed up or uh, you can see it, Chris. You know what I need. You have no idea of knowing how often they're having calves, yep. what the sex of the calves are, all, all these sort of really basic life history parameters that you can't get unless you can identify individuals. So now that we can identify individuals, we know we have mothers that have had three and four calves during the time we've been studying them. We have some females that have become grandmothers that we know of um, during the last 13 years. The right whale population was virtually wiped out by hunters and hovered on the verge of extinction in the early 1900s. Right whales have been protected worldwide since 1937, but the northern right whale population is not growing. To find out why, Mo is working on a collaborative study with researchers from Canada and the United States studying right whale genetics. Analyzing DNA from the whale's blubber and skin will answer questions about fertility, genetic diversity, and general health. Uh, a little bit. <laughs> to get skin and blubber samples, Mo had to get inventive. This crossbow designed to hunt moose and bear has been modified to become a laboratory instrument. Yeah, what was the time for B? I know it looks severe, but when you're 50 feet long and weigh 75 tons, Mo says it's like getting your finger pricked for a blood sample. So Ames, it's up to you then to uh, sort of judge whether or not you're good enough. Two whales. Can you be ready to back me up, Chris? Yep. I don't know if we're going to get that lucky. We may have to go after this one. Wow, once it comes big, up. fast speed. <laughs> <laughs> That's A. I didn't drive up on top of a whale acting like that. <laughs> <laughs>